Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Wednesday, July 29th, 2020. And I pray that our time together in God's word today is a blessing to all of us as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus as our Savior. Today, we remember three very dear friends of Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus of Bethany were disciples with whom Jesus had a special bond of love and friendship. John's Gospel records that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. On one occasion, Martha welcomed Jesus into their home for a meal. While Martha did all the work, Mary sat at Jesus' feet listening to his word and was commended by Jesus for choosing the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. When their brother Lazarus died, Jesus spoke to Martha this beautiful gospel promise. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Ironically, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Jews became more determined than ever to kill Jesus. Six days before Jesus was crucified, Mary anointed his feet with a very expensive fragrant oil and wiped them with her hair not knowing at the time she was doing it in preparation for Jesus's burial. Our Psalm for today is another section from Psalm 119. Let your faithful love come to me, Lord, your salvation as you promised. Then I can answer the one who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take the word of truth from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. I will always obey your instruction forever and ever. I will walk freely in an open place because I study your precepts. I will speak of your decrees before kings and not be ashamed. I delight in your commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and will meditate on your statutes. When the Lord gives someone a direct command, he expects that that person will carry out that command without, without question. Unfortunately, in our Old Testament reading for today, we see Saul deliberately disobey a very direct command that the Lord had given to him, setting up the circumstances for what we will see tomorrow when the Lord rejects Saul as his king. When Saul assumed the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies in every direction, against Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he caused havoc. He fought bravely, defeated the Amalekites, and rescued Israel from those who plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malkishua. The names of his two daughters were Merab, his firstborn, and Michael the younger. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimehaz. The name of the commander of his army was Abner, son of Saul's uncle Ner. Saul's father was Kish. Abner's father was Ner, son of Abiel. The conflict with the Philistines was fierce all of Saul's days, so whenever Saul noticed any strong or valiant man, he enlisted him. Samuel told Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people Israel. Now listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies says. I witness what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they opposed them along the way as they were coming out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them. Kill men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen and sheep, camels, and donkeys. Then Saul summoned the troops and counted them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set up an ambush in the wadi. He warned the Kenites, since you have showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt, go on and leave. Get away from the Amalekites or I'll sweep you away with them. So the Kenites withdrew from the Amalekites. Then Saul struck down the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is next to Egypt. He captured the king Agag. He captured King Agag of Amalek alive, but he completely destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the troops spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, 
goats, cattle, and choice animals, as well as the young rams and the best of everything else. They were not willing to destroy them, but they did destroy all the worthless and unwanted things. Paul has now been taken up to Caesarea, where he will now be, have an opportunity to stand before Governor Felix and give his testimony. Five days later, Ananias, the high priest, came down with some elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. These men presented their case against Paul to the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus began to accuse him and said, We enjoy great peace because of you, and reforms are taking place for the benefit of this nation because of your foresight. We acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with utmost gratitude. But so that I will not burden you any further, I request that you would be kind enough to give us a brief hearing. For we have found this man to be a plague, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the Roman world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to desecrate the temple, and so we apprehended him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to discern the truth about these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews also join in the attack alleging that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, because I know you have been a judge of this nation for many years, I am glad to offer my defense in what concerns me. You can verify for yourself that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. They didn't find me arguing with anyone or causing a disturbance among the crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or anywhere in the city. Neither can they prove the charges they are now making against me. But I admit this to you. I worship the God of my ancestors according to the way, which they call a sect, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. I have a hope in God, which these men themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. I always strive to have a clear conscience toward God and men. After many years, I came to bring charitable gifts and offerings to my people. While I was doing this, some Jews from Asia found me ritually purified in the temple, without a crowd and without any uproar. It is they who ought to be here before you to bring charges, if they have anything against me. Or let these men here state what wrongdoing they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, other than this one statement I shouted while standing among them. Today, I am on trial before you concerning the resurrection of the dead. Since Felix was well informed about the way, he adjourned the hearing, saying, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. He ordered that the centurion keep Paul under guard, though he could have some freedom, and that he should not prevent any of his friends from meeting his needs. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived their faith in Christ. Uh, not only were they dear um, and close friends to Jesus himself, by all accounts, uh, they were people who let their faith shine in their daily lives as well. In our reading for today from Veit Dietrich, a uh, early Lutheran uh, theologian and reformer, we're going to hear about the contrast between those who follow Christ and those who do not. Beloved Christians, the godly have their manner, and it is a good manner. The evil also have their characteristic, and it is an evil characteristic. The life of Christians is that they alone believe what is written about Christ in the law of Moses and in the prophets. Next, that they through Christ hope in the resurrection of the dead and eternal life. And in addition, that they practice and earnestly strive to have a good conscience everywhere both toward God through faith in Christ and toward men through blameless conduct. The life of the godless, on the other hand, is that they are terribly afraid of the preaching of the Holy Gospel and would rather not know it, lest it produce a heavy conscience. Next, that they are secure and have hope that everywhere and in all things they may enjoy the benefits of the people and their prayers. Moreover, they conduct themselves and use their office in such a way that they do not lose the world's favor. God grant that all of us, both authorities and subjects, 
flee the vices of the children and the rulers of the world, and instead follow the manner of God's children, and the Lord God's authorities, that we may forsake the evil and do the good, and thus have God's favor and blessing, and live for his honor and for the welfare of every man until death and our entrance into, the, into heaven. Amen. Our hymn for today is a stanza from the hymn, Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling. Holy Spirit, ever living as the church's very life. Holy Spirit, ever striving through us in a ceaseless strife. Holy Spirit, ever forming in the church the mind of Christ. You we praise with endless worship for your gifts and fruits unpriced. And we pray. Heavenly Father, your beloved Son befriended frail humans like us to make us your own. Teach us to be like Jesus' dear friends from Bethany, that we might serve him faithfully like Martha, learn from him earnestly like Mary, and ultimately be raised by him like Lazarus. Through their Lord and ours, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you all so much for spending this time in God's word with me today. God richly bless your day, and I will look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.